risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave of death. Where is your sting of grave? Where is your victory of church? Now stand in the light, the glory. Sting of grave, where is your victory of church? Come stand in the light. Our God is not dead, He's alive, He's alive. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Can you hear There's a new song breaking out from the children of freedom. Every race and every nation. Sing it out, sing a new hallelujah. Let us sing love to the nations, bringing hope of the grace that has freed us. Make him known and make him famous. Sing it out, sing a new hallelujah. Arise, let the church arise. Good morning, church. Let's go to God's word today. Shout joyful praises to God, all the earth. Sing about the glory of his name. Tell the world how glorious he is. God, how awesome are your deeds. Everything on earth will worship you. They will sing your praises, shouting your name in glorious songs. So let's sing to him this morning. Let's all stand together. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can reach? His breeze in the air, it shines in the light. 
streams from the hills it descends to the plain and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain frail children of dust and feeble as frail in thee do we trust nor find thee to fail thy mercies how tender how firm to the end our maker defender redeemer and friend i will worship, I will worship with all of my by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. 
church. Those of you who are new here, welcome. Today we come before the Lord in prayer. Pray with me. Lord God, thank you for this wonderful day and what you have given us. In your power and faithfulness, we come today to praise you for your goodness and love. Your love is so powerful, and we know you are with us in the good and the bad times. Jesus, you never disobeyed your Father God, and help us to try to be more like that every day. May we remember the sacrifice you made, not just for us, but for everybody. You made us all worthy. Thank you, Lord. Help church to be good for us all today and for church to keep going after the service is over. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, Felix. Y'all can all have a seat. I got to borrow that tie sometime. That was awesome. Good morning. And uh, wow, we just, uh, what, how awesome it is to be here with you all today. And Savannah and I are just thrilled um, to get to join this church and join Otter Creek in the roles um, that we're in now. And so thank you for giving us this opportunity. We're just thrilled to get to be um, with you and to be worshiping with you. And on behalf of my family, I want to thank all of you for being so encouraging and welcoming and hospitable. You guys have really made this place feel like home very quickly. And so thank you for that. And the cool thing is, is that we've been family. We've been related before we even met. From the time that we accepted Jesus Christ, from the time that we believed that he is Lord and Savior, we became family. And we became brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are connected with our family throughout the world. We are connected through our, with our family throughout history. And that is the beauty of the body of Christ. And that is be the beauty of his family and one of the things that I love so much about family, one of my favorite parts is eating together. Because I, I love to eat, and I love food, and I love sitting down at a table and eating good food together. There's just something so intimate about it. There's something that just brings us together, that just breaks down walls and barriers when we sit around the table and we eat together. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We are gathered around this table, this communion table that Jesus has set for us. And what he has set for us is a feast. And I know it physically, it doesn't look like much. It's a little piece of bread and a little bitty cup of juice. But what it signifies and spiritually what it means is a feast for us. And it is an incredible meal that we get to share together. And the thing about family is when we gather around this table, it's not always pretty. It's messy. Family is messy. And if you've walked into this place today and you feel broken and you feel messed up and that there's just something in your life or a darkness or a sin that you keep turning to, we want you to know that you are not alone, that you are in great company here today. We are all broken, messed up people that are in desperate need of Jesus Christ, that are in desperate need of a Savior and he offers us this grace that we've done nothing to earn, that we've done nothing to, to deserve, and we are so grateful for that. And so the trays are about to be passed around. If any of you are new here, um, we just want you to know that we invite you to share in this meal today. The bread's going to be pa passed around first, and just go ahead and just eat, and then the cup will be passed around shortly after that. But Jesus invites us to be a part of this with him today as a family as his sons and daughters. So let's go to him in prayer. Jesus, we thank you so much for this meal. We thank you for your body that was broken for us. We thank you that for your blood that was shed for us and poured out for atonement of our sin, to bring us back to you, to bring us back to God, to pay the debt that we could never pay. And so now as we eat and drink as a family, we give thanks, we remember you, and we just want to give you our devotion and our gratitude. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen.
Let's pray for the offering. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for the gift of today, the gift of friendship, of church community, of your Son, Jesus Christ. God, for all the gifts you've given us, help us to be generous with all of them, including our money. And God, help us as a church to be faithful to those gifts, to be risk takers, to be courageous, to be bold, to be innovative, to look into the future and to see the ways the kingdom of God is crashing into earth so we can be vessels for that venture. God, thank you for this money and the time that we are giving today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have the privilege this morning of introducing a couple of new families who will be joining the Otter Creek journey. I knew I was going to be introducing at the end of service Cole uh, Young and Savannah Swanson to you. I didn't realize I was going to be introducing the next preacher of the Otter Creek Church to you this morning. <laughs> But it's, it looks like the future is good. <laughs> Felix, that was awesome. 
Um, Sue Chen and Joe Ash Co are joining us today. We'll be introducing them in the second service, but they are originally from Malaysia. They've been married for nine years, and they've been in the States for seven months. And some of you have been around uh, a lot the, la the spring or the summer. You've seen this precious family. They are so passionate and such joyful, uh, interesting people. If you see the Co family, please introduce yourself to them. And also at second service, we'll be introducing Stephanie and Chase Slusher and their daughter, Abigail, who's 22 months old. So again, if you see this family, give them a hug or a fist bump or write them a note. Look them up in our uh, online direct directory and let them know um, that their presence here is very much welcome and encouraged. Last week, I started a conversation on fear and how fear works in our spirits and the way in which we are called as Jesus people to be honest, um, to name these fears. And I made a couple of observations last week to frame this series. Remember I said that I used to believe it was possible to rid ourselves of fear. Kind of think of coach speak before the game. But the more and more I've listened to people and the older that I've gotten and, and I've walked with people, I no longer think it's possible or even good to completely eliminate fear from our lives. But I do think it's possible. I would say it's essential that we learn to turn the volume down on fear from being a seven or eight on the knob to a two. One of my uh, favorite contemporary writers says it like this. She says, fear can ride in the car, but fear doesn't get to drive and fear doesn't get to pick the music. This is part of what it means to be a full, vibrant, healthy human, what Jesus called being fully alive, that we would live this abundant life kingdom life. So I made some observations last week, and I've been coming back to them all week, just thinking about different conversations and parts of my own journey, my own life. But I've been, I've been reflecting back, and if, if you weren't here last week, I'll just do this really quickly. I think one of the reasons that we feel paralyzed by fear is that we feel spiritually impotent. Now, this is not true, but we feel like we have no agency. We feel like we have no real power. We feel like if you've seen that Bill Murray movie, Groundhog's Day, we feel like we're living a Christian version of that. Like we're just kind of getting by and we think, man, if I just keep grinding, if I just keep working, I'm going to get to this place where I have shalom and peace in my life. And, and after time and you repeat these behaviors and you get frustrated and you don't measure up to who you want to be, you just start to give in to this idea that, man, I, I just feel spiritually weak. I feel like I can't change anything in my life. Um, that, that's a dangerous place to be. Uh, we also feel isolated. This is the irony of living in the social media age. We have all of these Facebook friends, but how many intimate friendships, true connections do we have in our everyday experience? Some of us are addicted to the 24-hour news cycle, and this is true of those on the right and those on the left. Those news outlets have one aim in mind. That's to keep you on the hook. So whether it's the situation room or the no spin zone or whatever it is, whatever cable station you watch, they just want to keep you on the hook and they want to keep you afraid. And then you live in anxiety and anxiety often leads to depression as we talked about last week. And then some of us are susceptible to social media addiction, obsession, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or Snapchat, some of you might be on your ESPN app right now thinking, what's coming today? It's July. Nothing's coming today on ESPN. <laughs> Sorry, baseball fans. Uh, but we get, we get uh, into this numb spiritual state where when we have 10 minutes, instead of opening the Psalms or praying the Lord's Prayer or connecting with a friend through an encouraging note or a phone call, we numb ourselves by opening our smartphones, which are making us dumb, Right? And this is now a new part just that's changed in the last 10 years in American culture where we have to be awake to what's happening to our brains when we get hooked on these repetitive or these uh, repeated behaviors. And all of this, I'm suggesting, leads to this increase in fear. And the irony is that we've never lived in a better time of human flourishing. By every measure and marker except for the soul, it is the best time to have ever been alive on planet Earth. And yet, many of us live in a constant state of fear, anxiety, and the obsession of what might come, worry. 
So this morning, I want to hone in on a particular part of our human experience that I think transcends your religion, but I think Christianity has something unique to say to this. This morning, I want to hone in on the fear of feeling rejected and being alone. And I'm going to get to Jesus in just a second because I think Jesus has an amazing amount to teach us about this. But I want to introduce this by way of a story that I could not believe. There is an online personality. um, His name is Sixth Form Poet. If you can go to this next image, Jeff. And there's some controversy around Sixth Form Poet. He writes with the alias, which is usually the first clue that there's going to be controversy. But he tells these incredible stories, these stories that make you just amazed at what it means to be a human. He told a story recently, and I will do my best to tell the story as he told it. But he tells the story that his father passed away when he was fairly young. And he made a discipline to visit his father's cemetery marker often. He would go as often as he could. Sometimes his mother would go with him and sometimes his grandparents His father's parents would go with him, and they always took flowers. They wanted to celebrate his life, not just remember his death. And so they took um, they took flowers often. After several months of doing this, this particular son noticed that the grave right next to his father's was never decorated with flowers. And he, being kind of a sensitive person, understanding how kind of how people work and just being sensitive to to life, he decided, and he didn't tell anyone, he decided he was going to buy flowers for this grave. Now, he noticed that this man died on Christmas Day at the age of 37, and he felt a connection to this man. Even though he didn't know him, the name didn't make sense to him. So he does this for two and a half years. He buys flowers for his father and this man in the grave next to his father. After two and a half years of doing this, he gets curious one day and he Googles this man, which it turns out was a terrible idea because he learns that the reason no one decorates this man's grave is because this man took his wife's life on Christmas Day and his own life. There is a reason why this man, even in his death, was all alone and isolated. Now here's where the story turns. He felt so guilty about decorating this grave for two and a half years for this guy who had committed this awful, heinous, violent act that he decides to find out who the wife was that lost her life and her family. He finds her grave across town and begins to decorate her grave with flowers as sort of a penance, and her parents are buried there too. So he buys enough flowers to decorate her grave and her parents' grave. After doing this for several months, one day a woman is standing behind him and she says, why are you decorating the grave of my aunt and my grandparents? And he tells the story and she can't believe it. And he comes back again and they meet. Two years later, they end up getting married. It's one of the greatest how I met your mother stories ever told, right? Now there's controversy. If you Google this, there's controversy about details of the story. Some people have accused him of embellishing parts of the story, which may or may not have happened. I'm not a detective, but my point is, do you see at every turn and point in the story a desire to feel connected, a desire to push back against loneliness and isolation? At every turn in the story, he said in his first retelling of this story, The fact that a man could be buried in a grave, die on Christmas Day at the age of 37, and not one person love him enough to put a flower on his grave told me everything that I needed to know, and that's why I acted. There was something in his spirit that compelled him to want to have this connection. I believe that all of us are afraid of being rejected and alone. This truth transcends race, age, ethnicity, sexual orientation, economics, political affiliation, Humans, we are not merely tribal, we are deeply relational. And I've experienced that living in Nashville for 10 years now. This is one of the most relational cities I've ever been in. Everywhere we go, we are looking for someone looking for us. And what I want to argue or present about Jesus this morning 
is I think Jesus helps us how to understand our loneliness and our fear of being alone. How do we steward those seasons of life where we feel like no one understands us and no one really sees us and no one really loves us? And to those of you who are single, um, whether you feel called to be single or you are single right now, you have so much to teach us about this because you have been stewarding your loneliness for much longer. And to those of you who are single, don't assume that people who are married all feel connected. Some of the loneliest people I know have been married for a long time. But following Jesus or discipleship means that we learn how to steward our fear of loneliness and our experience of loneliness. So I want to show you three snapshots in the life of Jesus and what Jesus has to teach us about this. The first is in Luke chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. Now, many of you know this story. You, you, you remember versions of this story, right? He's just been baptized. It's one of the few times in all of the New Testament where you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is my Son, whom I love and am well pleased. Father, Son, Spirit. This incredible crescendo, resurrection, mountaintop moment. And then Luke says, immediately, God's Spirit takes Jesus into the wilderness. It doesn't say the forces of darkness take Jesus into the wilderness, right? It says the Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted by the powers of the deceiver. So in other contexts, when we went through the Gospel of Luke, remember I distinguished what a rabbi taught me. There's a difference between being tempted and being tested. And the simple way to understand this is that to be tested is God's way of making you into the person he wants you to be. But to be tempted is, the, is Satan or the devil's way of destroying you from the human you could be. This is why there's controversy over that line in the Lord's Prayer now, lead us not into temptation. The Catholic Church has been weighing in on this because there's a difference between being tested and being tempted. And God wants to test you to make you stronger. Satan wants to tempt you in order to destroy you. So it could be alcohol, it could be pornography, it could be whatever you can fill in. But all of those things are at work. So when someone says, well, was that God or was that Satan? We think the answer is either one or the other. When uh, honestly, the answer is yes. Well, did, was that from God or was that from Satan? It depends. Did it test you or did it tempt you? Actually, you choose. So Jesus has just had this incredible moment of his life. There's all this momentum and energy and confidence building in him. I mean, he's got to feel like he's living his best life. It's all coming together, this master kingdom plan. And then before he knows it, he is all by himself, completely alone from everything that he had known, familial and relationally, right? And now he's going to find out who he really is. There is a gift in being alone. It's not just that you find out who you really are, but you find out how you're going to fight when you don't like what you discover. And Jesus is going to have to rely on all of his mama's training in the wilderness. And he's going to have these conversations, and it is a real spiritual battle. So the first thing I think Jesus teaches us in this snapshot is that loneliness is a normal part of what it means to be human. Jesus just didn't come to show us God, right? Jesus came to show us what it means to be human. And part of what it means to be human is to name and recognize you're going to feel alone and you don't need to be afraid of it. But if you embrace it as part of what it means to be human, then God can shape you into someone that he can't shape you into if you avoid being alone and feeling alone. If Jesus had skipped the 40 days and gone right from his baptism to his public ministry, he would not be ready for what's coming at the end of his life. And Luke tells you that at the end of chapter 4, when he says, and the devil left him and waited for an opportune time. Where is that? Gethsemane. When he's going to feel more alone and more isolated and more disconnected from his inner circle of friends than he has at any point in his three-year public ministry. Or what about in the Gospel of John? It's often referred to as the farewell discourse, but in John chapter 14, 
Jesus reminds me of a mother going away on a long trip, and the kids are going, the kids are saying, Where are you going? Can I come? How long are you going to be gone? Why aren't you taking us with you? And Jesus says to his kids, verse chapter 14, verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe in me. In my father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, Would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Right? So Jesus understands, look, my disciples are about to experience everything that I've experienced in a very powerful, tangible way. So he tells them in chapters 14 through 16, The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. It's mysterious. You can't exhaust it. You can't fully know it. But the Holy Spirit is going to invade you as a group and as individuals. And I'm going to be with you in that. You're going to have a mission and you're going to have each other. So you have the Spirit, you have a mission, and you have each other. That's how you deal with what's coming. Part of what Jesus is saying is you've got to learn to deal with loneliness in your life. You are are going to feel Like the world does not understand you. That's a big theme in the Gospel of John. Or what about in Jesus' words, the third snapshot? What about in Jesus' words in Luke chapter 22? In this climax scene in the the, um, Mount of Olives. Jesus says, Father, he's completely alone now, right? If you are willing... Remove this cup from me. He's saying, is there a plan B? Yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. So Jesus could have stood up and said, forget it. Everyone's abandoned me. No one understands me. I'm so misunderstood. I'm all by myself. Forget it. I'm done. I'm going back to Galilee. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to paint for 20. I don't know. He could have quit, right, and done something else. But instead, this painful moment of the realization that he's all by himself, everyone has abandoned him, drives him closer to God. Let me say something to you who are Christian leaders, and you're in the public sphere often, whether it's in your work or your business or whatever. Part of being a leader means you will feel lonelier than people who are not leaders. I cannot explain why, I just know it is. This is why so many leaders ruin their lives with terrible choices, because the loneliness becomes too much to bear. You can be the leader of a school, of a team, of an organization, of a hospital, of a church, and if you step into those roles, you'd better be ready to be alone. And Jesus was no exception to that. And he teaches us not to be afraid of it. So what I would like to do for a couple of moments, as I did last week, I would like to take these three texts, and we could spend hours in these three passages. But if, if these are normative texts which, which Jesus teaches us, we should expect and embrace loneliness. And that loneliness is part of the way that God draws us closer into his spirit. I want to be painfully practical today, like I was last week, much more so than when we were going through the book of Daniel the last six weeks. So first, I want to talk to you about how not to steward your loneliness, okay? And hopefully, (laughs) hopefully we won't be guilty of all of these, maybe just one of these. If you check all the boxes, you're in the right place, as Cole said, okay? How not to steward your loneliness. Number one, you cannot turn to people who are not living the life you desire. When we are lonely, we are, another word for that is we are vulnerable. And when we are vulnerable, we are always looking for someone looking for us. And we will attach ourselves to people that we normally wouldn't because of what we, we think they have to offer us. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't minister to the broken among us or the broken in our... That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying there has to be a component of our life that we are turning to people who are already living the life that we desire to live. If you catch me in between services and say, who are those five people, I can tell you right who they are. And I can tell you exactly why I've chosen to pursue those five people, to go on trips with those people, to go on vacations with those people, to call those people, to FaceTime with those people, because I want to be like them, and I think that's how the church is supposed to work. How not to steward our loneliness means... 
could look like we're turning to people who are not living the life we desire. We teach our students this, but as adults, we don't think it's true for us, and it is. Uh, the second thing to be aware of is becoming addicted to all things new. You know, I was thinking about this with automobiles the last couple of weeks because I've been looking for a, a, car, a new car for car. Hers was about to go. Um, it was older. And it is amazing how brilliant automakers are with this, right? Because as soon as you get a 2019 car, which we did not do, but as soon as you do it, what happens? The next year, the next model comes up, and you're like, oh, they changed the back of that car. That actually looks better. Do you know what I'm talking about? Liars. <laughs> oh, that's funny, preacher. You know what I'm talking about, right? You get a 2016 BMW or a Tacoma or whatever, and two years later, that, that's all part of the American obsession with new. And I don't know if it's uniquely American, but I know we do it really well, right? Every time the new iPhone comes out, some of you guys get a twitch. Like when Apple's going to do their little press conference and some of you are like, shut down life. Apple is about to tell us the thing that we didn't know we needed and it costs $1,200. All that is is the, the addiction to have the next new shiny thing. The reason I'm bringing this up with loneliness is what I've noticed about my own life is when you do take the hook and you have to have the new thing, you're actually emptier than you were before when you felt empty and thought the new thing would fill it. Because it doesn't. And then you feel like a fool. But someone makes a lot of money off you. Another uh, aspect to be aware of, of how not to steward our loneliness is by distracting ourselves with unhealthy commitments and habits. And I'll be the first to admit, sometimes church culture rewards people who can't say no. And what happens usually is those people get burned out and then mad at the thing, mad at the entity or the community that they profess to love because there's no health there. And so in their loneliness, in their feeling of I don't matter and I'm not connected to anybody and I don't have a real purpose to my life, right, you get distracted with unhealthy commitments and habits and you just kind of live your life according to your schedule and you don't even know who you are because you're just going from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. There's no room for contemplation or silence or being alone and being alone with yourself so that you can deal with who you really are and what's really going on in your life. I know every week if I don't get at least four different times by myself to go run it out on some hill in Nolansville somewhere, like I cannot be the person God called me to be because I'm distracted and I'm responding to all of your text messages and emails and private messages and dings and email and all of that that you guys all live in too right we get distracted by that stuff uh, the last thing uh, probably the most serious how not to steward our loneliness numbing the loneliness with food alcohol drugs shopping porn sports and entertainment and yes they all belong in the same category you know uh, our particular tradition, Churches of Christ, uh, and to this day, my parents will not drink um, and are uncomfortable with the fact that all three of their children on occasion have wine or a, a beer. But I think in some ways we've gone the other way because I think we don't talk about the power of alcohol enough in our church community, and I'm partly responsible for that. But I've noticed in church communities that come out of a more fundamentalist, conservative sect like Churches of Christ, once people are like, oh, actually, you won't go to hell if you have a glass of wine, we swing so far the other way, right? Like the kid who gets first year in college who lived in a really strict home, and then they go to college and just go crazy. We swing the other way. But the truth is, we still are tempted to numb our loneliness with food and alcohol and drugs and shopping and pornography, and sports, and entertainment. And in America, you cannot run out of options to consume those things. There are as many options as you have money. And these are multi, multi-billion dollar industries that are seeking to recruit you in entertainment, and sports, and pornography, and shopping, and drugs, and alcohol, and food. And just like some people are tempted to you know, surf their smartphones looking for all this stuff, we're tempted in our private moments where we don't know how to steward our loneliness. We think we can hide from God. 
and we end up feeling worse because those things do not deliver. They cannot deliver. That's the definition of an idol. Okay, so that was really a depressing 20 minutes. Can we end on some resurrection, please? All right, here we go. So how can we steward our loneliness for Jesus' fame and glory? This first one might not sound convincing to you, but I believe it. One of the most powerful things I've ever done in my life is to learn to pray the Lord's Prayer every single day. I believe that the entire gospel message is encapsulated in Jesus' prayer. And just in case there's some of you who still think it's a Catholic prayer, it's not a Catholic prayer. It's in Matthew's gospel. Someone said that to me one time. Why do you guys pray that Catholic prayer at Otter Creek? What are you talking about? It's the Lord's Prayer. It's Catholic. No, it's not. <laughs> It belongs to all of Christianity. It's in Matthew's gospel right there, Matthew 6. Go look it up. Trust the Lord's prayer. When, on the occasion, when I have conversations with friends who are agnostic or atheists, and they say, okay, I'm interested in Christianity. Where do I start? I always say the first, same thing. Start with the Lord's prayer. Pray it every day. Pray it out loud when you're at TJ Maxx and there's a line of 35 people and the cash register is not motivated at all, right? Our Father, who art in heaven, right there at the Brentwood TJ Maxx, hallowed be thy name. Even if you don't believe it, part of the, the genius of the prayer is it works on you over time. I have occasional, I'll have nights where I can't sleep. Our Father, hit your knees, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Keep something on your wrist or on your necklace to remind you to pray the Lord's Prayer. There is power in these symbols that we can connect our body. It's not magic, but there is power in it. Another thing we can do to steward our loneliness is we can share appropriately with the right people at the right time for the right reasons. All three of those are critical components. Choose people that you trust. We talked about gossip last week. By the way, if you have someone who's always gossiping to you about other people, guess what they're doing to other people about you? Every time. Oh, so I got a witness in the back. We're having church. Was that Roxanne? We're having church now. Share appropriately with the right people at the right time for the right reasons. Hopefully this comes out of your life group or your accountability group or someone you admire in a Bible class that you're attending at 10 a.m. Hopefully that's the start of that kind of Christian community. Another thing we can do to steward our fear or experience of loneliness is to practice solitude. I'm going to give you a practical way to do this this week. When you drive in your car, do not listen to a podcast. Do not listen to the radio. Go in complete silence. For some of you, I know it will drive you crazy at first. But there comes a season of your life when you have so much noise and so much stress and so many people pulling at you that you learn to crave silence. David Rubio has been my teacher. When he came off of sabbatical, I asked him privately, I said, what's, what's one of the best things about your sabbatical? He said, I don't need to listen to anything. He said, when I'm driving down Franklin Road at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., I can actually hear the birds. I can actually hear the wind coming in through the window. I can hear the sound, the music of God. I don't need to fill it with sports talk radio or political junk. Like, I can just crave that silence as a connection point to God. Now, if, you're, if that makes you nervous, just try it for 10 minutes a day and then build up. And you will be amazed the way that it can cleanse you from the inside out. And connected to this, the last thing you can do to steward your loneliness. We could do 20. I'm just picking four. But evaluate what you're allowing into your spirit, right? Some of the movies that we watch, we can watch them, but they don't help us grow closer to Jesus. Some of the TV shows that we watch, we can watch them, but they don't help us grow closer to Jesus. Some of the conversations we're a part of, God's not going to zap you in the middle of that conversation, but it's not helping you grow to be like Jesus. Being like Jesus needs to become the evaluating measure of the choices that we're participating in. Right? That's why Paul was such a genius practically on this. All things are permissible, but they're not all beneficial. What was he saying? Yes, you can do them, but is it going to help you to be shaped into the image of Jesus? Because what we see in Jesus in Luke 4 and in John 14 through 16 and in Luke 22 is a Jesus who realized loneliness is coming for everybody. Whether you're afraid of it or not, it will be your experience. 
So part of our task as Christians in this world that we find, this time that we find ourselves in, is to learn how to steward that fear and anxiety of being alone and rejected. And to see it not as this awful experience of being human, but as part of the way that God gets our attention to say, focus on what really matters. Connection to God and connection to each other. Everything else is just distraction. This is why Jesus said, because he had the discipline of being alone, of being in solitude. This is why he could have the clarity to say, you want to know the Shema? You want to know what it all is about? Love God and love people. That should keep you busy for your whole life. Our shepherds will be in front to pray and in the prayer room uh, in the back. I want to ask our worship team to join me um, as we pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let's stand. God, thank you for the gift of today. And for the gift of the life of Jesus, which not just lives in Scripture, but lives in this community. God, thank you for Jesus' presence right now in our midst to leave the pages of Scripture into our spirits. And God, we thank you for every person in this room today, no matter where they are on their journey, new, veteran, wherever they are in their journey of faith, God. Thank you for this sacred time we have as we face a new week to face your power and presence in our lives, as together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will
chapter for us here at Otter Creek as, as Cole uh, and Savannah join us. So if you two could make your way on down here. Okay. Um, and, and if you are a family, is, is, are, is Allison and Brindley and Landon and anybody else? Are they on? Yeah, if you guys can come on down. That would be great. And is Colton here? We're trying to, come on Colton. All right. Allison was not excited that you just called her to come. <laughs> You're being a good sport, Allison. Come on. We are, we are so excited that you guys are, are joining us, for, that all of you are. Uh, uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for consenting to be our, uh, our worship ministers. Um, uh, this is something that uh, has been long in, uh, a long process, but we are so excited about uh, about our future together. Cole and Savannah, you stand in a long tradition of worship leaders at Otter Creek. Buddy Arnold, whose presence is still felt today. Brandon Scott Thomas, Murray Sanderson, and Randy Gill. We are confident, though, that you guys will be who God called you to be and not them. We love your gifts, your passion, and most of all, your desire for Jesus. We believe that God brought you to Otter Creek for this season for very particular reasons. And uh, we are trying to create and further a culture uh, that has long been established here at Otter Creek for going on, getting close to a century now. 
uh, a culture of worship where our natural reaction to whatever season of life we are in is to worship God. If things are wonderful and we're on the mountaintop, that our reaction is to worship God. And if things are not so wonderful and we're in the valley, that our reaction is to worship God. And one of the things that we do, whether we're on a mountain or whether we're in the valley, is we get together and we sing. And we sing songs and the words and the music from the mountaintop and the valley being sung at the same time is beautiful and it's powerful. Uh, and, and for us to get together, that is something we can't do by way of podcast. That is something that we can't do by way of reading a good book. It is something that we do together. Um, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, every pronoun in the Lord's pl Prayer is plural. It's our Father, and it's give us this day, and it's, and it's lead us not into temptation. Um, we, can, we can kid ourselves into thinking that it's all I, Phone, and I, Kevin, and I, Cole, and I, Savannah, but it's we. It's we. And so uh, we, are, we are excited about that. And we're marking today for your family and Savannah, your family, we're marking today because we want to be in this for the long haul with you guys. We want to grow not just in worship, but in our effort to follow Jesus. So we honor you guys today and we honor your family who are going to be here all morning. And we're excited for this new chapter. So, uh, church, if you can, just stand and we have a prayer of blessing that we would like to read together and say together um, uh, to Cole and Savannah. And as we close, let's, let's say these words together. We celebrate God's leading today. We, we will support, support, pray, and love Cole, Savannah, and their families. As our worship ministers, we look to you to guide us in worship, music, and the arts. We covenant to share our lives with you, to welcome you into the holy and mundane, the good and the bad. We are thankful for your gifts and passion for God's people. Amen. Go in peace. Amen. saving grace. He will reign forever. He is ancient of days. He's the Alpha Omega, beginning and end. He's my Savior, Messiah, Redeemer, and Friend. He's my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for I will follow, I will follow, I will listen.
kings. He is mighty God, Lord of everything. He's Emmanuel, he's the great I am. He's the Prince of Peace, who is the Lamb. He's the living God, he's my saving grace. He will reign forever, he is ancient of days. He's the Alpha Omega, beginning and end. He's my Savior, Messiah, Redeemer, and Friend. He's my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for Him. When my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on. You are the light, you are the fight within my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. I will sing into the night. Christ is risen and on high. Greater is he living in me than in the world. No surrender, no retreat. We are free and we're redeemed. We will declare over despair you are the hope. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Nothing is impossible. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. Stronger than our hearts, you are greater than the dark.